Thanks for joining us on the Page One Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Peters of New Air Appliances. And before we get started here, um, in this episode, we're going to learn from Jim Schlecher on how he guides CEOs and companies through COVID. And we're also going to learn about his new book. In the past, Jim is the author of Great CEOs Are Lazy. It's an awesome book. Um, and this is Jim's second time on the Page One Podcast. And uh, previous, you know, I had read his book and reached out to him. So we're going to get into that. And before we get started, just got a quick new announcement. I need everybody's help here. If you know a vacation homeowner, uh, a new cause that I'm working on, check out vetcation.org. Uh, you can see how we're supporting veterans with Dream Vacation. So the goal here is to get... Uh, vacation owners, vacation homeowners together, because we got plenty of veterans, worthy families who need a vacation. Um, they serve this country and um, check it out. You can learn more at vetcation.org. You can email me or find me on LinkedIn. Okay, let's get into this episode. Jim helps leaders grow companies. Before he started the Inc. CEO project, a firm that mentors fast grow CEOs. He ran a technology business valued at 1.6 billion. He has also done business in 28 countries, has a regular column on entrepreneurial growth issues on Inc.com, and he has spent over 10,000 hours speaking with and interviewing CEOs. He recently published the best-selling book, Great CEOs Are Lazy. Jim's an engineer, an avid soccer player, a certified sommelier, and recently climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. So Jim, how... T- t- before we get started here, talk to us about that climb. How long did it take and how much prep did you have to do? Um, well, hey, look, great to be back with you again. Um, you know, it, uh, there are a couple of ways of getting up to the top of Kilimanjaro, but uh, we took a longer pathway, so seven days up, two days down. You can do it in as little as three up and one down, but the problem is the main reason why people don't make it to the top of Kilimanjaro is altitude sickness because it's high it's over 19,000 feet and um your body only acclimatizes so fast so if you go up quick you run the risk of getting altitude sickness and not getting to the top if you go up slow like we did and that's a pretty slow way to the top you increase your probability of making it to the top because your body can acclimatize and so everybody i was with made it to the top and uh it, it was pretty great and on the way down a blizzard happened, so we, we were right at the beginning of snow season. We were probably one of the last groups to make it to the top, or that day or two were the last couple of days to make it to the top without snow. So it was a great experience. I highly recommend it. That's awesome. Well, I want to do that, and I always kind of joke around with my kids that we're going to climb uh, Mount Whitney, which is kind of in, not in our backyard, but it's about five, six hours away, and I think it's about 14, five. And yeah. uh, <clears throat> so we haven't done it. But uh, my, my last time I was over by in the back of Yosemite, not in Yosemite, but in the back. And I was climbing with my kids and, and one of my nephews and he got altitude sickness and it was only at uh, about, yeah, it was only at about 10,000 feet. Um, yep. And it was bad. I mean, we were really, really worried. We had to get him down. And the problem is we were out in the middle of nowhere. So it took us about two, three hours to hike back down. But uh, yeah, altitude sickness is real. Um, it's real. Yeah. Yep. And and that's the only answer. Once you get it, I mean, there's things you can do to prevent it, but once you get it, the only answer is go down. That, that's yeah. your only choice. So um, you need to try Whitney. A real quick story before we get into it. But I, I climb to the top. I, I get to high base camp. I'm feeling like a million bucks. The next morning I wake up and there's an older guy. His name is Joseph. I got in the next camp over. I got talking to him, Joseph. And um, he, uh, I said, Joseph, you know, did you make it to the top? Yeah, I made it. I got to ask you, Joseph, like, how old are you? And he goes, well, I'm, I'm about, to, I'm going to have a birthday on Friday. I'm like, okay, so how old are you going to be on Friday? He says, I'm going to be 80 years old oh, wow. on Friday. Yeah, right? Well, and here's the thing. What inspired him to do it is he climbed Whitney. He's from Southern California. Oh, yeah. And after he climbed it, all his buddies are like, well, what are you going to do next? And he just totally made it up. He said, I'm going to climb Kilimanjaro. And now he's like, oh, dang, now I got to do it. <laughs> so wow. that's why he was on top of the mountain because he climbed Whitney first. So can be done. 80-year-old Joseph did, did it. You can do it. Yeah, well, that, that's a heck of a story. And, and you know, <laughs> everybody talks, you know, in the popular media, you hear about a Mount Everest and 30, you know, 29,000. But, yeah, even mm. 12,000, even 14,000. Like, there's a lot of altitude sickness to be dealt with. Um, so, totally. yeah, cool. Well, anyways, that that's a great story. So let's... 
You know, I guess um, before we get into this, you know, your first book, Great CEOs Are Lazy, are you able to kind of give us the, you know, just the audience, the quick uh, summary of that, you know, just so they can understand where you're coming from and a little bit more about your background and how you think and help people. Yes, absolutely. We, we, uh, we work with CEOs and, I, and I've interviewed thousands and thousands of CEOs. And over time, it became clear that some of them were just, frankly, better CEOs than the others. And, and I could tell in you know, five or 10 minutes on the phone, whether they were or won't and uh, were or weren't. And the, the thing that really discriminated the good ones from the maybe more average performers was this idea. Um, and the idea is that in every system you can name, um, there is a point of constraint, something that limits the capacity of the system to execute. Um, you know, if we're thinking about mountain climbing, it might be my lungs or my legs or something like that. In the case of a business, it can be a lot of different things. It could be, you know, my marketing isn't strong enough. It could be my sales force isn't, uh, or it could be my manufacturing process isn't able to hold the volume or whatever it would be. But Good CEOs figure out where that point of constraint is. And I, I call that in the book the kink in the hose because everybody gets, you know, when there's a kink in the hose, I don't get water out the end. And the only way to get water out the end is to open up the kink in the hose. Same thing's true in the business. If I want to increase the capacity of the business, either in profit or revenue or growth or whatever, I got to go find the kink that's stopping me from doing that and open it up. And that's what the really good CEOs did differently. They were looking for the kink and they were opening it, opening it up. The bad CEOs or less good, let's say, were just throwing their time at the business, hoping something stuck at the wall. But frankly, they weren't quite certain what the job was about. Um, and by the way, I'll just represent that MBA school doesn't particularly help here because I've got one and it, it doesn't help with this issue. That's funny. So do you, do you throw time at it trying to solve lots of activity or do you just, focus on the point of constraint and open it up. Turns out you can be really effective and you don't have to work 80 hours a week if you use that methodology. And that's where the title comes from, that great CEOs are lazy because they only work, you know, 40, 50 hours a week, kind of a normal work week, not a crazy work week. So that, that's where the book is about. And that's what we do. Yeah. And it's a, it's a fun read too. So definitely recommend mm -hmm. that to everybody. Um, Jim, why don't we start with the story? Um, obviously, you know, the, the theme here, we're going to talk about getting companies through COVID. Again, you've worked, like you said, with thousands of CEOs. So why don't you start with this story about a big challenge, maybe one of your clients, what they dealt with, um, what went wrong, how do they solve it? That'd be great. Absolutely. So one of the firms we work with, and we work with about a hundred CEOs, teach them this methodology and helping them grow their business. Um, they ran a string of beauty salons. Um, so, you know, with COVID, uh, you're shut down. That's the end of that. Um, and lots and lots of people in a, in a big business. He, he did have to downsize a bit, but he also had a, a line of beauty products inside his salon, very high end, made by a third party, but, you know, with his branding and so forth. So he rotated the business to become an e-commerce beauty supply company. Um, and was able to grow that business enough that it now represents about half the business, half the historic business. And now as he's beginning to open up at some level, that's a huge line of revenue for him that he didn't have before COVID. It helped save the company and now has become an extremely profitable ongoing piece of the business. So he made a complete rotation to e-commerce, to a product that was sort of an afterthought before. He thought the, the business was the salon business. And really it's become a beauty care product business with a salon business wrapped around it. And uh, so a very successful transformation as a result of COVID. And now that he's coming out of it, he's got two, two uh, cylinders fire and hard to grow that business and make him money. So a really good outcome. And, you know, he never would have focused on that, that gem inside the business and polished it into what it is today. If he hadn't had COVID force him to do that. So there's a really good story of a survival story and a, you know, come out better than we went in story. And, and it really only because of what happened to the business that he was required to do that. So there, there's a good example of a, a COVID story that we'd be exposed to. Yeah. And that's so, that's going to be so hard for somebody who doesn't really get e-commerce to no. literally create an e-commerce business. I mean, did he, is he mainly selling on Amazon? Is it his own product or is he just, is he reselling products that he already had on the shelf? Um, how is he able to, you know, where did he find success there? 
Yeah, he created his own capacity to do e-commerce, which which is is very possible. You know, you don't have to be a genius to figure this out. The, there's help available. Um, you know, he had the product, he had the manufacturing capacity. Um, he didn't go to Amazon, um, and uh, he went. He sells off his own site, but he's made it fairly efficient. And we'll talk about that later, I'm sure. Um, and retained his brand um, because there are a lot of risks in going to Amazon that we could talk about later if you want to, but. Yep. Uh, all on his own, built his own system. And I think the value there, Luke, is that he didn't train people to use another system to find him. They still go to his website, which is where they can make appointments and find out about his locations. And they, he didn't create another habit that he then had to break in the future. He maintained the habit of come to me to get your product, to get your beauty product and get your care. Um, so when things turn, they go exactly where they've always been going. I think the people that sort of moved to an Amazon model, not that that's the wrong answer, but now if I now want to bring them back to my own brand, uh, I've kind of got to retrain them from going to Amazon. So he never had to go through that process. Yeah, I mean, well, he did it the hard way, honestly. It's a lot harder to, yeah. you know, create your own customer flow and your own traffic, but uh, but also he built his own brand. So that, well, that's a great story. Yes. And, um, and it's, yeah, it's not so easy just finding a product and throwing it up on Amazon. He had to he, he had to do everything and probably fill, figure out fulfillment. And um, that's great. So, you know, getting into a few more ideas and again, with our theme on COVID, but also thinking of mm. just helping CEOs. So for CEOs, what are the key mistakes in leadership that you seem or that you see? Yeah. You know, uh, one of the biggest one that we see with CEOs um, is, is that they outthink their organization. Um, this is particularly true for visionary CEOs and kind of see the future. That's sort of one of their gifts. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I've been guilty of it in my, in my career as well. And they go, look, uh, this is going to happen, then this, then this, then this, then this. And of course, and then we dominate the universe, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And they share that whole line of thinking with their company. And people look at them like they're from Pluto. Because they go, you're out of your mind. Like those things, like those things don't go together. There's no way that's all going to happen. Now, I can tell you that for really leader people that take leadership positions have have particular skills, and if they have this skill, they they really do see this line of thinking and how it can come together. And sure, there's some ifs and thens and therefores inside the argument, but they can see things that other people can't see. That's their gift. And so we have to coach them. And what happens is they, if they share all of it, they lose credibility with their team. As they go, the boss is just crazy, right? He's talking about stuff that's never going to happen. It's improbable. And they can, he can lose the followership, if you will. And, and leadership is, you only have, you're only a leader if you have followers. So if you lose your followership, you're no longer a leader. So it's a real problem to do this. What we coach them on is say, look, take your 10 point plan and share the first three points. You put the rest in your back pocket. I'm not saying we're not going to get there, but you don't tell your team that that's your plan. And that sounds kind of anti-transparent. And, 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 and I'm all about transparency with leadership. I think you have to be transparent, particularly in this environment but, and, and going forward. But you're going to damage yourself in the organization if you try to lay it all out in one shot. What you've got to do is put it in bite-sized pieces so that people can understand it, digest it, execute against it. And once they've executed the first two points, then you show them points four and five. We'll get to 10. Don't worry. But we're going to do it in pieces. And, and that has been really dramatic in terms of changing how they lead their companies and allowing them to retain credibility and allow them to keep people engaged in the mission as they go on this, what they know to be a long journey, but they only tell people a mile at a time or two miles at a time. So that, that's been a really core leadership mistake that we've seen. And, and that's sort of how you respond to that situation. Um, yep. And we've seen that work as well. So, and you've yeah. probably seen leaders that are up there, visionary guys or gals, and they say stuff and you go, how the heck do they think that's going to happen? Right. And um, it's because they're sharing everything and they shouldn't. Yeah, no, I can, I can relate. I think, and I have a lot of friends, I can see the same, same thing over and over again. I mean, that that's, and it's so hard to hold back, but I, but, Kind I know. Of your explanation makes sense. Uh, or sometimes, you know, we're explaining the idea and in our mind, it, it makes sense. And we, you're right. We don't fill in all the ifs, ands, and buts. We just kind of have the idea, but we 
intuitively know all of those things. We just don't say it. And so others right. don't really get it. Right. And, and, and no. we're kind of just not communicating it. Right. Well, and, and I think that's another important point, Luke, is you're, as a leader, you, you've got to show your work. Um, you know, there are times that you can make that intuitive leap and say, hey, if that's true, we can go do this. And people go, well, I'm going to what? What are you talking about? I mean, how do you get that? And you go, oh, wait, 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 wait. All right. Well, if this happens, it means that must have happened. You've got to show your logical work of how you got to that answer. And if you're super intuitive, sometimes that's a real struggle. But if you're intuitive, you lose people really easily. So you got to go back, think through how you got to that answer, and then show that to the team. So showing your work um, as you go on this journey with people is, 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 is the way you don't lose people as, uh, on, the, on the path. Because um, if you jump to the conclusion and you don't show your work, you're going to just lose a lot of people. So, yeah, got to show your work definitely important. Yeah. And, and on those same lines, you know, what communication mistakes are CEOs making? Is, is it along those same types of ideas or are there kind of different themes that you see? Yeah, it, it's, um, it, it's partially there, but I think of communication. We, when you think about communication, there's a sender and a receiver and a message. And I think the mistake that people make is a lack of appreciation for the receiver. And so, first mistake is they think everybody's like me. And so let's say you're a real intuitive and I'm talking to another intuitive. I go, Hey, you know, because of this, we can go do this new thing. And they go, Oh my gosh, you're right about that. How cool. And they get it because they're intuitive. But there are a lot of people in this world that think differently than you or I or any leader. And you've got to meet them where they are. So let's say they're highly analytic right? They're very step-by-step. Step. They need the data. Those people are really valuable. So that, you know, uh, intuitives don't drive the bus off the, off the cliff. Somebody's asking questions before we drive it off the cliff. Mm -hmm. So they're super important organizationally, but they think different. And so if you try that intuitive hand-waving thing with them, the message won't be received. So you've got to think about the receivers of your messages and you've got to communicate in a way that works for them, not for you. In fact, as a leader, you have to be chameleon-like in that you meet people where they are. And if that means you've got to go slow, then you go slow. If it means they need more data than you do to get to the answer, then you've got to meet, either get them the data or give them the time to go get the data so that they become comfortable with your decisions and your views. And so I think this is where EQ plays into leadership which is know yourself and have the emotional maturity to flex your behaviors to meet other people. The people with low emotional maturity, low EQ, can't flex. So like, you know, they're like Popeye. I am what I am and I'm not going to be anything different. And so the ones that are able to think about who they're talking to and meet them where they are are the ones that can be really effective. And so I think that's where the communication breakdown occurs is, I sent the message my way, but because I'm talking to a different human being that looks and thinks about things differently, they didn't receive it properly. And so that's where communication breaks down. So great leaders are thoughtful about their audience and they frame and share the message in a way that their audience can receive it. And I'll give you an example. Let's say I'm talking about some, you know, MBA word laden strategy about, you know, uh, competencies and competitive advantages and, you know, da, da, da. well, if I'm going to go tell, let's say I do an all hands meeting and I want to share that strategy, I wouldn't use those words. I'd frame it differently because the people in the audience probably won't understand some of that, those concepts nor appreciate them. So I got to share it a little bit differently. So there's a good example of you got to meet your audience where there is, they are to get the communication to be effective. And, um, well, yeah, the last point there is that, that if you're really trying to communicate, there's no resentment around that. It is what it is. And, and that's what leaders do. And so some people will resent the fact that I have to change my behavior to meet somebody else. And, and for my money, that's just, uh, that's probably not thinking about it the right way. Totally. And, and, and it's even harder now, you know, with zoom and it's mm. like the communication has to be even more clear, right? Cause you don't, you're not there with the person face to face often. So it's, 
it's difficult. True. Um, Jim, kind of going on with, uh, you know, I was thinking about this and, and, and with your book, you know, great CEOs are lazy finding the kink. You know, I love the analogy and it, and it's, you know, the way I think about it is just, you know, Hey, we're here to solve problems. We're here to execute on our plan. Um, and we're here for the vision, you know, to create that vision and maintain the vision of the company as CEOs. But, you know, when CEOs are solving problems and fixing kinks, how then should they pass the job off to the team? Um, you know, how do yeah. they prevent the team from being overloaded? What if the team has, you know, trouble switching goals, which I, I mean, honestly, that's, I, I mean, I, myself and my friends, that's like a common thing. And, um, mm. I guess more just to kind of go into the, more into this question, the reason I bring it up is because, you know, we all companies as companies, we all have goals, you know, we'll create our yearly goals. And so now the team is off and running, you know, but the CEOs are always tinkering and finding new things. So now it's, you know, the end of Q1 and all of a sudden there's this new project that comes up, but it's important in, in, and you know, the company should do it because why wait until next year to, to add that to the plan when it's a, you know, clear and present opportunity. And, uh, so that's kind of the context in it. And, you know, back to the question is how then should these, uh, new ideas, these fixes to the kinks be kind of passed off to the team? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, you know, I, I think it starts with, um, remember that you're not a publicly traded company. Um, this whole idea of annual budgets and annual plans and so forth, that became, that came because of public companies had a public market that ran through the cadence of a calendar, a year, right? But if we're a private company, well, we're not the only people we have to worry about is maybe ourselves if we're the primary shareholder or a couple of people who are the shareholders. So forget it. Why don't we do, why don't we do financial planning every quarter? And why don't we do strategic, why don't we do tactical planning every quarter? Why not? What's the diff? And so I think you have to not be bound by the annual plan so much um, and be willing to be a little more flexible if you're a privately held company. So having said that, there are two hats that we don't talk much about in the great CEOs are lazy. So it has this model of five hats of the CEO, which, and I know you read the book, but two of them are uh, player and what I called learner or later I called analyst. And when you're trying to find the kink, which is the first part of it, you use either the analyst hat, which is a more passive hat. I'm going to go, you know, look at reports, look at data, do spreadsheets, talk to people, the player mo mode is I'm going to dive in and I'm going to be part of the process and I'm going to learn that way. So they're both learning hats, trying to find the kink. Um, but the one's a little more active than the other. And the player hat is uh, more for kind of those twitchy entrepreneurs that they got to do something. But when I, what I tell people is when you're looking to find the kink, it needs to be, and particularly when you're in player mode, it needs to be like a bad party. So when you go to a bad party, you know you're only staying for an hour because that's the minimum obligation, and you know where the exit is because you're that's you're making funny. a way for it at the end of one hour, right? Yep. <laughs> we're, we're going to do something fun. Let's get out of here. When you're in that that player mode, it needs to be like a bad party that you're not staying in it. You're getting out of it, and you're only going to stay for a period of time. So what I tell people is, once you go with, dive in and you find the kink, you're going to fix the kink with either generally the coach hat or the engineer hat, meaning I'm going to either re-engineer the process or I'm going to change the talent around the problem or both. And so part of that conversation and that thinking has to be, how does this fit in, particularly on the talent side, how does this fit in with everything else we're doing? Can I shift talent to cover this because this is more important or do I need to add talent to cover this problem because it's a big enough problem that it needs its own talent um, or it has enough revenue against it or enough p profit against it that it needs its own talent to, to care and mind it. So I, I think it's dive in with player or analyst, find the kink, and then come out of player mode with a permanent fix with either talent or process or both. And so when you're thinking about how does it rack and stack against all the other things in our list, that's part of your thinking when you think about the talent problem is – can the team handle this? Do I need to take something off their plate to make room for this? Or do I need to add some talent to cover this? Um, and, you know, my, my read is that there's always 
something that if it's really a kink, like the thing that's stopping the business from getting where it wants to be, there's always something less important than that that I can get rid of. Um, but I think that's hard for a lot of people to say no to things. Easy to say yes, hard to say no. Um, and so that's maybe where the problem really is, is you just don't want to say no to something that, gee, three months ago we thought that was important, and now we're going to say no to it. Are we stupid? Are we? No, just things change. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Well, you know what, and that's, and I, what I, the part I really liked was kind of just your analogy. Hey, we're not a public company and you're a hundred percent right. I mean, it's great to do the annual planning, but, um, most of the goals can be kept, but things change. And, uh, I think that I, I like the other phrase you said, you know, don't be bound by the annual plan. So yeah, good, 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 different, you know, kind of a change of thinking, and especially a lot of people that you know, that have run larger companies or have worked with larger budgeting processes and they come into smaller companies and sometimes they'll bring that, which is great. The discipline is great, right. but then they can get kind of hung up too much on, you know, sticking with things, even if it's, if there's a better way. So kind of like that right. different way of thinking. Let's, let's kind of move over now to, um, kind of just thinking more specifically about COVID and how that's changed, uh, you know, how consumers are, interacting with retailers. And I think you kind of, yeah. you kind of had a funny word, the amortization of the consumer, you know, Amazon is now the standard, um, things have changed with COVID. Uh, why don't you kick it off with that? You know, what, what are the two th big things that have changed and, and where do companies now need to keep up? Yep. Uh, and I'll take this from two ends of the spectrum. I'll take it from sort of an e-commerce end of the spectrum, and then I'll take it from a, a brick and mortar. And, you know, if you're a bl bricks and cr clicks, you can take both parts of this, right? Um, so on, on the e-commerce side, you know, a big part of what people did that, during this period is they refined their e-commerce platforms, their processes, and so forth. And so it is, they, they become frictionless. They become super easy to do business with. And so a, a true competitive advantage is you're easy to do business with. Um, it's easy to find the product. It's easy to find the reviews and the information. It's easy to order when I decide I want it. I can compare it to my other options fairly readily. And the standard here is Amazon. That's why I use, it's the Amazonization, if that's a word, it is now, um, <laughs> of, of the e-commerce market. Because if you're not as good as Amazon, and I mean both B2C and B2B, because remember, you B, you say, wow, it's B2B. We don't have to meet that standard. Stop. Those people go home or maybe at their desk. Well, they are home now. <laughs> and yep. when they're done trying to buy something on your B2B platform, they're going over to Amazon to buy shoes for the kids. And they're having an amazing, easy, seamless, frictionless experience. And they're going to scratch their head and say, why do I have to suffer through your crummy B2B e-commerce platform? So it applies both B2C and B2B. If you aren't as good or almost as good, because you probably can't be quite as good as Amazon, um, you're at a competitive disadvantage because that's the standard now because they taught everybody what easy looks like. And so your version of easy, you can't define it. They've defined it for you. So if you're, you've got to be responsive to the Amazon model of e-commerce and the experience and the number of clicks and the visit, all of that, you have to be competitive with them. And I'm sorry to report that because it ain't cheap, but that's what it needs to look like to be competitive. On the bricks side, so the bricks and mortar side, the first thing to realize is that well, people aren't coming back. And that's got to be a, that's got to be a tough thing for people to in those businesses to hear, you know, that well, it's not going to come back not. to the level it was. Yeah, no way. I mean, people have become accustomed to shopping online. They like it. It's convenient. Um, you know, the options have improved. And so for a whole lot of things that they used to go to the store for, they're not going to the store for. I'll give you an example. Um, I rarely go to the, to my pharmacy. I used to go once in a while to buy shampoo and razors and stuff like that. I don't do that anymore. It's all online on subscription now. It just shows up every 30 days or 60 days, depending on what it is. I don't, I don't go buy that anymore. It's over. And so they're expecting me to come back and buy razors it's going to be a really long wait because <laughs> I'm not coming back. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, you know, and just like, you know, when, you know, again, I'll give you another example, just to pick on travel for the second. You know, we used to hop on a plane fairly readily to go see people. And now I think we've proven the fact that the virtual presence of zoom 
is good enough for an awful lot of stuff. Not everything, to your point earlier, but a lot of it. And when somebody says, hey, Jim, hop on a plane, fly two hours, and let's have a two-hour meeting, and then spend the rest of the day getting home, I'll go, you know, why don't we just get on a video call and see if we can get it done there, right? And so I'm never yeah. getting back on the plane. So they'll, they're not going to return to their current their levels pre-COVID for, I, I'm going to say, three or four years or maybe never. So how do you get people to come into your stores? What do you do? And, and my comment is that you've got to make that experience so unique and different and interesting. I mean, a really crafted customer experience that they go, you, you've got to go to the mall with me to go to the store because it is so cool. You've got to get that so good. They're going to tell their friends how cool it is because they just want to go to your store and experience it. And part of that is going to help you with the, with the store, uh, the showroom. Because that's the risk. If you're a stack them high and let them fly kind of place, you run the risk of being showroom. You know, I can find it. I find that pair of sneakers. I uh, I take a picture of the uh, of the name. I go on Amazon. Hey, I can get it for five bucks cheaper, and it'll be there tomorrow. I can wait a day for five bucks. Done. And they just showroomed you. But if you've given them an amazing experience while they're, you're in there, unique products, custom products, uh, uh, for you only type of products. Um, you know, the probability they're going to show room you is reduced. You know, uh, you talked earlier about mattresses. They are the masters of preventing the showrooming because, you know, and I've tried to shop a mattress. It's almost impossible. You know, I, I try to get, I know it's from the same company, but in one place it's the super queen and the next one it's the primo queen and the mm -hmm. third one it's the tropical queen. And do, I cannot tell the difference between they got different color on the outside. They're described a little differently. It's probably the same exact product, but I can't tell. So I can't shop them. So that's another strategy people use. But I think experience is what it's all about. And, and I want to tell you the secret to experiences. The secret to an experience is surprising quality. Surprising quality. And that is, I went in here and, and something happened in the experience that I didn't expect that was positive. And Jim, are you, are you able, is there a story around that? Something tangible that, you know, for the audience that you can share? Um, Cause that's yeah, a tough I'm, one, I'm, you know? It, it is. Um, I'll, I'll pick on Disney because they're the masters at engineering. What they, they call them Disney moments, but they, they're all engineered. It's not random. Okay. I'll give you an example. Um, when you get in line at Disney world or Disneyland and you'll see a sign that says um, the front of the line is 20 minutes from here. I don't know if you know this, but the real front of the line is 10 minutes away. Oh, and that's interesting. That. Yeah, that is and, interesting. And, and so what they do is they set you up for 20 minutes. And when you're up at the front of the line in 10 minutes, you go, wow, that wasn't so bad. That was kind of cool. That was good, right? And they just took standing in line from a negative to a positive, mm -hmm. which is insane. <laughs> but it's all about they set the expectations right. Um, they'll have characters show up at unique places at, at different moments. And you go, oh my gosh, it's Mickey Mouse. And it's a, a positive, surprising quality. It's not particularly predictable. It's designed not to be predictable. But you'll be walking through, you know, uh, Tomorrowland, and there's Mickey in a spacesuit. Wow, super cool. Um, and so they design that on purpose to have that experience. I'll give you other ones that are good at this. And they kind of leave it to the people. But have you ever seen any of the videos of the, um, the landing spiel? from the Southwest airline people you ever seen any of these videos? Mm, no, I mean, I've, I'm no? sure I've seen it, but I, I don't have, okay. Yeah. Don't if, have a clear. If, you, if you've got, if you've got 15 minutes to kill, go, go, go on YouTube and go Southwest airlines landing speech. And they, they, because it's designed to be fun, Southwest, let, as long as they hit the markers for FAA requirements, they can have some fun with the speech that they give when we're landing. You know, we're now preparing to land in San Diego. Please buckle your seatbelt. One of them is a guy does a rap. And it is so cool, right? I mean, literally the entire plane cheers when this guy's done with his rap. That's funny. And it's the exact same information you and I have heard a hundred times. But he raps it and he makes it fun. Well, there's surprising quality, right? It was an airplane ride to San Diego and it cost $237. Ugh. But this guy on the plane did a rap, and it was so cool. Boom, surprising quality. 
who am I going to fly next time? Southwest. Is the guy is the next guy going to rap? I don't know. He might or might not, but he did once. He might do it again. And so surprising that, that keeping people guessing about, by the way, it can't be the same all the time. If it's always the same, it's, it becomes predictable. It's no longer surprising. But if it's surprising quality, that's one of the fun things that you can build into. So you might want to think about that customer experience of, and how do I build fun and surprise into it that they can't get, they can't get that online. They can't get that experience online. And so it does take real thought and real engineering to build it in. But I think if you do that, that's why people are going to come back to your store. And that's why they're going to bring their friends back to your store. Yeah. If you go back to your same old model of just showroom the product and da da da, they'll show up. You're going to really struggle getting people back in your store. Or, or, and also do what your other client did and take some of their business online. That's just the way people are going. So if you've already got well, the store, you've already got the clients, you might as well add on that other segment. Um, you know, just absolutely. And that, yeah. that was a brilliant, you know, he, he, he the, the wind was blowing in that direction. So he put his sail up and he, and he went that way. So it was smart on his part. It really was. A lot of people would have resisted it. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, so yeah, that's certainly an option is, is, is bail on bail on bricks and mortar. And we've seen a bunch of really retailers, uh, let's pick on Brooks brothers. They're, they're all online now. Yep. J J crew. It's all online now. And so they decided we don't need the storefront anymore. We can do make more money more effectively online than we could having storefront. And so that is a viable option to say we're out of the business of being in storefronts. So Jim, with that, you know, just kind of wrapping this up, because I, I, I want to finish with your new book, but before we get there, yeah. so, so we talked about, you know, Hey, the world is, Amazon is basically the standard. The world has changed. Um, you know, you're coaching CEOs and, you know, there's a lot of things you could talk about. You could talk about, you know, the, but let, let's, you know, more directly, you could talk about sales, you could talk about marketing or, or product. Like those are the three things they could focus on. Of course they could focus on leadership and uh, recruiting and all of these things. What is, what's the area where, you know, you're most commonly having to help people. Is it on one of those areas that I just mentioned or somewhere else? I'm just, yeah, you know, again, yeah. for themes, sales, what comes up? Sales, marketing, talent, um, yeah. product. Um, I would say the, the, the main, and we tend to work with growth companies it's sort of our specialty mm -hmm. but continuing to drive growth is where we spend most of our time um and that again that could be process or that could be people um but generally it's on revenue generation revenue cycle management um finding new sources of revenue creating a better offer and a customer experience that brings revenue to the store or to the business uh, that's where we spend an awful lot of our time is, is revenue 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 Product is less of an issue. And, and to be honest, we're not experts at designing products. So we spend a little less time there. We, we, we can ask a question about, you know, why are people going to buy from you? And I go, well, it's blue instead of purple and it's 1% cheaper. And I go, then nobody's going to buy from you. <laughs> right? That, that's not enough. Yeah, exactly. To get people to buy. They don't have enough right? differentiation. You need a better reason to buy. You need a better, better reason to buy. So we'll get in at that level. Mm -hmm. So revenue. Okay. And when you're going revenue, what is the, you know, again, what's the common theme? Do companies, how are they improving their revenue? Do they actually have to get a, a improved talent or is it that they just didn't get strategic enough on how to find new accounts? Um, let, let's go a layer deeper. What do they end up having yep. to do to increase that revenue? Yeah. Most of the time, Luke, it's the business model. Um, and, and, and I talk about in the book about the architect's hat, but Yep. Somehow their business model is getting in the way of them going to the next level. And, and it's sort of like the model that got me to here can't get me to there. And so you need to innovate and improve the business model to make it even more compelling and make it more profitable and make it a better business. And so uh, that that's where it sits. I'll, get, I'll give you one quick example. Um, so we had a client we worked with in the electronics distribution business. He sold to the government and he, um, He's, it was just transactional. He sold, you know, servers and computers and stuff like that to the government. Good business, big revenue, really low margin. And just every month, like, got a hammer like crazy just to make the number every single month. There's no recurring revenue in it. He began to move up the value chain at our coaching to do higher value work, like consulting um, and designing systems for people. Because these all went into a system that got designed by somebody. Uh, later began to specialize in designing cyber secure 
environment, which became really important, and then began to take over the maintenance of the design and maintenance of those networks. So now we built a, a recurring revenue model out of it. And over time, the business was no longer about selling hardware. The business was engineering, designing cybersecure environments and managing and maintaining them for customers. So moved it almost completely to a services business. But the beauty of that was super sticky because they didn't want, once he was running their networks, they didn't want to get rid of them. Uh, high margin, because much higher margin than selling product, um, and generally very long contracts. And so he had a lot of recurring revenue and predictability. So he vastly improved his revenue, he improved his profitability, he improved his predictability, and he increased the value of his business with all three of those moves. So there'd be a classic example of complete shift from just selling product and chasing revenue dollars to in the same space with some of the same technology, changing the nature of the business to a better quality business with better margin, better profit, better growth. Yeah, I love that example. I mean, the big things that stick that stand out there is he created recurring revenue, which obviously everybody wants. Mm -hmm and built new revenue streams. He had one and all of a sudden he's got these others. And at first it might not sound appetizing, you know, to go from selling a product to, to selling time and consulting, but obviously he found a way to do it and probably hired on a team to do it. And, and since it was highly technical, they probably had really good, you know, rates and margins. So, um, and it was sticky, I guess it kind of, it was kind of symbiotic with the rest of his, uh, his revenue streams. So, it was, yeah, and but but risky, you know. I'm hiring these very high price, yeah, you know, brainiacs to do this consulting, and man, I hope I can fill their time, right? That was the first move, and now it's moved to more of a contractual basis. So he's not so much selling hours because you don't want to substitute selling stuff to selling hours. That's not a really big upgrade. Mm -hmm. It's moving to those long term contracts with the maintenance and the support, and the that's where it really changed the nature of this business. That's awesome. Well, Jim, why don't we finish up with your new book? So tell us about <clears throat> professional drinking. That's a, a funny, uh, a catchy title. Um, <laughs> what, what are you talking about? What are you writing about? Yeah. I mean, who knew it was a job? I would have applied a long time. Yeah, ago, right? for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yep. um, so the idea here is about building relationships. Um, and one of the things I've done over 30 years of working with CEOs and, and in sales and marketing before that is build relationships with people. And, and a lot of the time that happens um, over adult beverages, largely in a restaurant. You know, let's go have a meal, let's have coffee, let's have a burger. And so I really wanted to get at, there's lots of wine books and cocktail books and you can learn how to make a Negroni and all that jazz. But how do you actually entertain professionally? How do you put your clients at ease, get a great bottle of wine, Learn how to engage with a CE, uh, with a sommelier or a waiter. How do you pair with what your what your clients might be having for dinner so that the food and the wine go together? And and how do you not make a mistake? How do you feel comfortable and confident in that environment? And and really, look, this came from. You know, I work with CEOs all the time, and we go to fancy restaurants. And you know, you can take a CEO, commander of the universe, confident in their environment, and I hand them a wine list. And their hands start shaking and the flop sweat starts, oh, right? Funny. They just yeah. don't, they, they don't know what to do. They got money. They just, they don't know what to do. So they just throw money at the problem and buy something expensive, but that's not the best move. And so the, the design here is that you can read this book, become comfortable in that environment, feel confident around your clients and be able to give them and you a better experience so you can build that relationship that ends up leading to more business and uh, and maybe a friend. Um, and so that's what the book is about. Um, I actually went and became a certified sommelier uh, to kind of uh, learn about this stuff and then ended up writing a book from that experience, as well as my 30 years of you know business entertaining around the planet. So it's a fun book. It's an easy read. It's designed to make people comfortable and confident in that environment. I probably didn't release it at the right time in the middle of COVID, but you know, we are heading back into the restaurants. You will need this information, boys and girls. So uh, professional drinking, you can grab it on Amazon. The audio book just came out by the way. <clears throat> so you can listen to me if you want to put yourself to sleep. But, no, you actually do. Uh, it. You do a good job <laughs> just so the audience yeah. knows uh, in your first book. I mean, you, you actually did a great job on it. So I'm, I'm going to check that out. It's funny you bring that up because I actually was just out at a couple dinners, important ones. And uh, I, I better read this thing because I think I made the wrong choice. I bought a, 
you know, the, the wine list was passed back and around to three different people and it, it got, it yeah. got to me. And, uh, I like Pinots just cause they're usually not too, too big and they, they kind of work with things, but I guess I'm, I must've been the only one that liked Pinots because I look around at everybody's glasses, you know, half an hour later and they're all still full. Uh, so, well, that's, that's usually not a good sign. No. Yeah, I, you know, I got to say my, depending on the size of the table, I'll get a white and a red. So yeah. the white drinkers can just white and a red. But yeah, you, you got to look at what people are drinking and eating. And, and what's funny is a lot of my clients, um, they like those big, massive red wines, like a meal in a bottle. And, and I like something a little more elegant. So what they, and, and this is part of being a good host. I know that's their preference. And even though it's not mine, that's what I order because I know that's what's going to make them happy, even though I may not prefer it. It's not about you. It's about them. And so, you know, you want a big Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon with your sober soul, then God love you. That's what we're getting. <laughs> 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 even though every book in the world will tell you that's not the right thing to do. But if that's what makes them happy, that's what we're drinking. So. A, couple, a couple of those bottles and it'll be a really fun dinner, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> After a couple, it doesn't matter what you're drinking. Yeah. So that's, that's right. Order, order the expensive stuff first because the second or third doesn't matter. That's yep. so funny. Well, listen, we're going to have, a, we'll have a link to that uh, professional drinking uh, in the footnotes here on the website for this podcast. And uh, Jim, just want to, again, uh, thank you for coming on. How can everybody find you? Is uh, LinkedIn the best place or also you might want to give out uh, your yeah, website? Li LinkedIn uh, or uh, so Jim Schlexer, just go to LinkedIn. I'm pretty, pr pretty high profile. Or you can go to um, the Inc. I N C ceoproject.com inc ceoproject.com and you can find out all about what we do i think we have some links to the professional drinking thing if not professionaldrinking.com you can find out all about the books and a bunch of blogs i wrote there and some videos i've done on on uh, on the topic as well awesome well listen i want to thank uh, everybody for joining us today truly appreciate your reviews on itunes hope you join us for the next interview and before i let everybody go remember head on over to vetcation.org if you are a vacation property owner and you want to kind of support this new cause, uh, getting military families a dream vacation. If you're not a vacation owner and you know somebody, you can uh, ping them for me. That would be awesome. Vetcation.org. Take care, everybody.